Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, um, especially from so far, many of you. And we're really delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Judy Coffin. I am one of the co-hosts of uh, French Press, which is run by the Society for French Historical Studies. And since we have a very uh, full agenda for the next hour, I am simply going to welcome you and pass it over to um, our other co-host and the uh, the wonderful leader of the Society for French Historical Studies, Tabitha Ewing. Over to you, Tabitha. Wonderful, thank you, Judy. Uh, normally, Sally Charnal would be here as the um, co-organizer of French Press, which is a platform um, that the Society uses to do all kinds of very cool things, like introduce new books and so on. Um, we, um, I wanted to say first and foremost that this is exceptionally organized as uh, not just through the Society for French Historical Studies, but co-sponsored by Africa as a Country, which is fantastic, and, um, and generously sponsored by the Center for Civic Engagement at Bard College, the Center for Human Rights and the Arts at Bard College, French Studies, the French Studies Program, Historical Studies Program, Human Rights Project, Office of the Dean of, of the College, and the Science, Technology, and Society Program, all at Bard College. And one of the reasons why I wanted Bard's co-sponsorship was because we on our campus, where I am professor, uh, have not had a whole lot recognizing the uh, rather earth shattering events that have been taking place on the continent in the last, um, I'd say, 15 months. And so just this one particular, uh, very specific history that links the interests of uh, uh, French historians, or those who are interested in uh, the history of France, Francophone world, and especially what we might call beyond France. And there, um, as with the guest who I'm about to introduce, I'm particularly interested in the oblique relationships that um, an intervention by way of French history allows, right? So that um, it isn't necessarily uh, repeated reading imperial histories such as they've already been told for a century or more, um, but rather using um, French history as, in this case, um, I don't, it was a little bit more than heuristically, uh, but nevertheless, as a way for us to think intellectually um, and to be engaged with um, the world as it is on the ground through lived experience, not necessarily centering France, um, but allowing for France to, um, uh, to uh, open up possibilities of or sight lines that might not otherwise be there. Um, so I'm particularly thrilled uh, to have Karina Ray, um, who is, and I'm going to read here, uh, because this is a recent position, AM and HP Bentley Chair in African History and Associate Professor at the Great University of Michigan. Um, you may already know her book, Crossing the Color Line, Race, Sex, and the Cultural Politics of Colonialism in Ghana, and, um, and also has a co-edited volume that I, I don't want us to forget called Darfur and the Crisis of Governance in Sudan, a critical reader, and so important for us to think about that right now. Um, Karina is also series editor of New African Histories with the Ohio University Press and with African Identities Past and Present with Cambridge University Press and Ohio Short Stories of Africa with Afri uh, Ohio University Press. So um, Karina, please, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, hopefully you'll introduce us to our other wonderful guest. Yes, thank you so much, Tabitha, and thanks so much for the invitation to be here with um, all of you today. I'm really grateful, and you know, any any opportunity to hang out with you, uh, Tabitha, and with Idrisu is always very welcome. And I'm really delighted um, to be able to introduce uh, Idrisu Morakapai, who is a Benimois filmmaker, uh, whose award-winning body of socially relevant and artistically compelling work tells the stories of people who are underrepresented in mainstream productions. Uh, his filmography includes the documentary features Sigeri Ki, The Queen Mother, 2002, Arlit, The Second Paris, which we're here to discuss today, 2005, Indochina, Traces of a Mother from 2011, and American, America Street, 2019. And just because of the crowd that's gathered here today, I, I want to also flag everybody's attention to the film I just mentioned, uh, Indochina or Indochine Traces of a Mother from 2011. This is a really important and brilliant film that um, looks at the intimate relationships that formed between um, 
Beninois um, soldiers conscripted into the French colonial army to put down the anti-colonial resistance in Vietnam. So it's while it's sort of centered within this kind of colonial and anti-colonial moment, it does something very unusual when we think about sort of interracial relationships in the context of colonialism, which is to center those which form between um, colonial subjects that are in, in many ways set against one another, and yet nonetheless end up forming these, these relationships and, and traces um, the, the search of, of one of the children of these unions who sent back um, to Benin with his father and goes back to Vietnam as an adult and looking for traces of his mother. And it's just so powerful. So I, I, I really um, encourage you all to check that out. So Idrisu's films have been screened in prestigious film festivals in Berlin, Rotterdam, Vienna, Milan, uh, Busan, Marseille, Sheffield, and many other places. Um, his work has garnered numerous international accolades, including the TV Best Documentary Award in Belgium, the Best Documentary Award from the 15th African, Asian, and Latin American Film Festival in Italy, um, the Amiens Metropole Award from France, and he's also the recipient of uh, the 2013 Prince Klaus Award. Uh, Idrisu is an assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies, uh, Media Arts, Sciences, and Studies at Ithaca College, where he teaches film production. Most recently, he's the Okwi and Wezor Fellow at the Africa Institute in Sharjah, UAE, where he joins us from now and the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is supporting his ongoing work uh, on Border Life, a feature length creative documentary on Seme, a bustling border town between Nigeria and Benin, where the lives of peddlers, smugglers, travelers, and ordinary citizens are deeply intertwined in ways that open up a window into the localization of global economic exchanges. Um, and here I just want to shift a little bit in this introduction um, to talk about the, you know, how um, how I've sort of in a way grown with Idrisu's um, films, which have been indispensable to the work that I do in the classroom teaching African history and other related subjects. Um, just like those few books and articles that I return to semester after semester because of their unmatched pedagogical value, his films allow my students to critically engage Africa's past and presence with nuance and compassion. The added value of his impressive body of cine cinemagraphic work is that the medium itself grabs students' attention and imagination in novel ways that allows them to access the sights and sounds of African life and to develop an appreciation for the women and men who he renders with such clarity and grace in his films. In 2012, I taught Arlit the Second Paris for the first time um, as as part of a fully integrated service learning course called the African City, Urban History and the Making of the Global African World. The course explored the histories of a range of African and African diaspora cities. And I wanted to include case studies that would expand a student's vision of what constitutes a city. Arli, the film and city is, a, is as stunning as it is sparse. And all of you who've already watched the film will understand that description. Once a, a city bustling from the profits of the uranium trade, its fortunes went into steep decline in the 1990s after the price of uranium plummeted. Idrisu picks up Arlit's story just at the point when most people had forgotten about it. Viewers are confronted with the devastating effects of predatory mining and environmental degradation, including their epidemiological consequences in Niger. The enduring colonial model of resource extraction coupled with the machinations of neo-colonial exploitation are on full display to see. But Morikapai Idrisu is uh, also interested in understanding how Africans have remade Arlit in the wake of its increasing irrelevance to European economies and geopolitical interests. To this end, the film opens a painful dialogue about the perils of migration across the Sahara and about those who languish or who are lost along the way. No longer fueled by uranium uh, boom, Arlit is now an important node in the expansive human trafficking networks that annually move hundreds of thousands of Africans across the Sahara. Idrisu's film vividly brings to life what one leg of that dangerous yet increasingly ubiquitous journey looks like and sounds like set against the ghostly backdrop of Arlit's vanquished glory. In, uh, as a generous and invested artist, Idrisu readily accepted my invitation to screen the film at Fordham back in 2012. In the conversation that ensued with my students, he revealed that he himself had passed through Arlit 
as he made the perilous journey from his home in northern Benin across the Sahara to Algeria and then across, across the Mediterranean to southern Italy before making his way to Germany where he later attended film school. This piece of biographical information made a powerful impression on my students, blowing open new ways of understanding the film that they had just watched and challenging them to think in more critical ways about the process of migration itself. In this way, the film had an unexpected impact on my students who were then working at the Mid Manhattan Adult Learning Center in Harlem with African immigrants who were seeking conversational fluency in English. It opened their eyes to the many and varied circumstances that their conversation partners might have faced during their own migration processes, subjects that for obvious reasons, their partners usually refrained from discussing. And finally, as we fast forward to 2023, there is ample media coverage of the migration crisis and its impact on Africans among many others. But in 2005, when our elite debuted, this was not the case. Um, Idrisu truly broke new ground with this film. I continue to teach our elite, not just in the African city, but also in my many other African history courses where it helps me to explore themes related to colonial and post-colonial extractive economies, neocolonialism, the environment, and of course, migration. All of these themes are once again at the forefront of current events in Niger in the wake of the 2023 military coup, which removed President Mohamed Bazoum from power at a moment when Niger's dwindling uranium supply has a renewed importance to France's ability to sustain its dependence on nuclear power in the face of the Russian-Ukraine war and its implications for France's ability to rely on Russian uranium. So with all of that in view, I turn it over to Idrisu Morakapai. Idrisu. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, this generous uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And I deeply also appreciate your initiative um, in fostering this important discussion. And I'm grateful for, for the opportunity to be part of, of it. Um, although I should fear uh, honored that my film, uh, almost two decades uh, since uh, its making, is still relevant. Uh, it's also somewhat depressing. Uh, I would have hoped that the issues addressed there would have been improved by now. Uh, alas, that is not the case. Um, I first visited Arlit in the 80s as a Karina mentioned, uh, on my way to Europe uh, via North Africa. And back then I witnessed the economic boom nostalgically uh, depicted by the characters in the film, uh, which had uh, uh, left a lasting impression on, on me during that period. However, what truly propelled me to create this film was when I met Issa, my character, uh, during uh, my trip back home. Uh, Issa, had hosted me during my stopover in Arlit in the 80s, and now lived in our village uh, after his retirement. Um, his shocking stories about the causes of his illness and the tragic death of his friends, his portrayal of the town in decline, of an abandoned population, and of the migrants are passing through the town on their journey to Europe. It all triggered my interest in exploring this place for a documentary project. Uh, when I returned to shoot the film, I was armed with a clear vision. While the investigative aspect was crucial, my primary focus was on crafting a cinematically compelling nar narrative I wanted to find a camera language uh, that could visually, even without text, capture these two key aspects of life in Arlit. On, on the one hand, the contamination that slowly ate up workers' bodies. On the other hand, the waiting, the void, and the isolation in this beautiful, but also overpowering environment of the Sahara. So how can you visually show the feeling of suffocation 
and being trapped uh, with, uh, within a nature, a natural landscape that invoke infinity of space, but also threaten to kill you. Um, during the shooting, my team had uh, to deal with suspicion <laughs> uh, and fear of lo local authorities who presume our presence was related to scrutinized workers' condition and contamination. Our equipment was confiscated on the first day. And we were somehow to explain the same subject where I try to present a more general and uh, innocuous uh, interest in our lived history. Even though there were, we were allowed to film, tension persisted until the end of the filming, prompting me to take precautions to safeguard our tapes at the passion. This experience, it's uh, of course not unique. Uh, African state officials often view documentary filmmakers with suspicion uh, as our work is perceived uh, as being against the interests of the country. In Niger, this skepticism was notably more pronounced in my case, given the crucial role of uranium. So to give you some figures, uranium constitutes 32% of a uh, percent of, uh, of the country's export but shockingly, they only contribute to 5% of the national version. Areva, the French company of which the state holds almost half of the share, had in 2013, a global revenue of 13 billion, which was twice the worth of Niger's entire economy. So to come back to my experience during the shooting, the authorities mistrusted authorities to mis mistrust on the score of the awareness of uh, malpractices in uranium extraction. Local officials for, from Areva knew that in, in other contexts that they could be charged in, of criminal neglect, but have show, uh, shows silence due to self-interest, uh, enjoying substantial salary while neglecting the welfare of the, of the people and the economic well-being of the country. So during the shoot, I even uncovered the active de deception practices by local doctors who lied about illness linked to radioactive co contamination. What is curious is the fact that my entire team were given protective suits, but the workers we were filming did not wear any as you can see in the scene in the scene in the underground mine. Furthermore, in Arlit, I was always struck by the economic by the company's paternalistic discourse uh, that claimed to be in Niger for altruistic reasons. While the proof profit came from uranium mines in Canada or Kazakhstan, French nationals I met there repeated. Same narrative of assistance, asserting that without Areva, our lead and the country itself would face a disaster. So Areva's attitude in Niger was in some ways replicated by French mainstream media with reception in my, of my film. Uh, that was hesitant to take, well, take up the claim I made in this film. It was important to mention that in France, there's a large consensus about the role of nuclear energy. Uh, this prevailing sentiment has contributed to a reluctance in the media to critique the practices of uranium mining in general, unless the issue directly affected French workers. For instance, following the closure of the of Limousin uranium mining, that's in the southern part of France, workers who developed cancer because of their mining activities successfully sued the government. However, a similar legal recourse has not been possible for workers in Niger. In France, it was especially festivals run by anti-globalization and anti-nuclear activists that pushed a debate of the film into different cycles. French mainstream festivals were more hesitant to screen our lead. Nonetheless, Following successful pressure from 
those activists, Areva Hesley provided protective equipment and funded some projects uh, in, in Niger. Still, these initiatives are nothing compared to the company's colossal annual profit. I also want to remind the several names change through which the company tried to rebrand itself. Uh, during the shoot, the company operated under the name Kojima. And subsequently, it, it became Areva. And in 2018, the company changed once again and is presently known as o o Orano. <laughs> so, so Orano or Areva had several opportunities to rectify its mistake and shift you know, away from this neo-colonial uh, exploitation practice by embracing a policy of equal exchange. exchange. But unfortunately, they failed to size this opportunity. So the recent, recent political upheavals in West Africa, particularly in Niger, did not surprise me. Uh, it was evident that uh, the people will support any coup that would overthrow the corrupt government. So for now, I want to stay here. And so we can open the debate, uh, a question in case uh, you have some. Karina, to you. Yeah. No, yes. thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, for that yeah. background. And, and in fact, you sort of anticipated what my first question was going to be, which was um, to just talk a little bit about how your own experience passing through, you know, our leap set the stage for the subsequent film that you did, um, and and so you've you've really already done that um, so well. So so thank you for that. But I just think it's really you know important to acknowledge that 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 connection with um, with the uh, the Beninois people that you that you encountered there. Um, was was really was really important, and in a way that I think for me, what's so powerful about this film is the way that it brings these two really critical um, uh, issues into connection with one another. That is this question of um, the uranium mining and the, um, the the rise of Arlit's importance as this hub in these trans-Saharan migration networks. And one of the things that um, I found really actually quite fascinating to think about, you know, so you were you were doing, you were making the film in the early 2000s, it comes out in 2005, mm -hmm. um, is the way in which, in some ways, the depiction of the human trafficking networks um, is, is deeply humanized um, we understand it in a way that I don't think sort of the way that it's captured in today's representations in the media would seem familiar, right? The, the, the represent, representation today is, is of an of a industry that is, is, is predatory, um, that is parasitic, um, that brings out the very worst in human beings who are attempting to make a profit off of the desperation of other people. But in the film, you know, you have, I think, around uh, between the, the 20 and 25 minutes into the film, a sequence of interviews um, with, with migrants themselves who are talking about the desperation um, that, that, that is sending them uh, across the Sahara, but also with the Tuareg men who smuggle the migrants across the, the desert. Um, and, and then with Amadou, the Beninois uh, mechanic who fixes these cars. Um, and one of the things that's so amazing is just how interdependent these people are in this town. Um, and it's, so it's not this depiction of the, the parasitic or predatory relations that we tend to think of. Um, what comes out actually as the predatory industry in this town is the remnants of the uranium mining that, that still continue, right? Even as it's no longer kind of creating the... Yeah. Profits. And so I just wanted to maybe start off by asking you to talk about the tension between these two um, industries, if you will, that um, that sustain um, our elites uh, economy and social fabric in the early 2000s. And 
you know, to my mind, one of the questions that I, I kept on thinking about as, you know, as my mind has been so saturated with much more recent depictions of the, the inhumanity of, of human trafficking across the Sahara and the Mediterranean wow. yeah. is whether something to your mind has fundamentally changed in how human trafficking is um, conducted uh, or whether or not there's just an aspect of it that that goes, that it may be inhumane, you know, but there's an aspect of its humanity in the interpersonal relations and dependency that develop in a place like our league that we just don't see anymore because the human toll is so grave and all we can think about and do is mourn all of those who perish in the Mediterranean Sea. So that's my first question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and nothing has changed actually apart from uh, what Europe is trying to do, how the policy, it's a European policy to stop, to try to stop them while using uh, North African countries, for instance, right? And as a, a, uh, as a new border, European, European border, right? So that's the shame. But the flow, the human flow from Africa, from the South, from I mean, from the places and countries in the South of the Sahara, to, it's con still continuing. I mean, if you go to Niger, you can, we see, you still see a lot of people. You know, I, I don't know if you get to, uh, uh, to, to, to know that Niger now changed the policy. You know, they refuse now to be part of uh, this movement that Europe is funding them, who is funding Niger, you know, to stop, you know, to arrest and send the uh, migrants back home. Uh, that's what they refuse. Even, you know, at the time I was filming, uh, that happened too, right? So those Africans, some Africans got arrested. Uh, in my case, for instance, when uh, when I finished my shoot, uh, uh, I've been given two Togolese in my car uh, to take them to Benin because they got uh, kicked out of, of the country. Uh, uh, that happened too. But at the same time, so many people were, uh, you know, uh, in you know, waiting in Arlit or in Agadez, you know, for for, for a trip to 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 the place, uh, I mean, to to the north. Uh, it, what actually also struck me when uh, when I came to Arlit is how close, how connected these cases were, but at the same time, they were so disconnected, right? <laughs> Migration and then the exploitation of the mines. You know, how few the people knew uh, about the mines, even for those who were living there, or even the Tuaregs, they, 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 how few they know about the mines, for instance about all you know, the situation and describing the film, the illnesses, even the economic uh, economic aspect of the exploitation, because they were not involved in, in it, right? And the same time, when you see it from the global, you know, uh, uh, perspective, you see how close, how connected and they're connected. African youth are moving outside of Africa. They are going to try their chance elsewhere because uh, uh, of the lack of opportunities in Africa. So at the same time, you have big companies, multinational, that making profit in this country, exploiting, you know, without <laughs> using African youth, right? And the few that work there, you know, is those who, 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 who I mean, who, who got sick, sick, right? So that's, uh, I mean, it's uh, also, I mean, myself as a filmmaker, yeah, that's, uh, in the, I, I, I started with uh, with the destiny of my character, but when I came and on the ground uh, on the location, I noticed that it, you know the story was way more than what I previously <laughs> imagined. Right? Uh, uh, for instance, this migration, this uh, the tragic story, uh, uh, aspect of the film. I, I wasn't prepared, for, right? As a documentary filmmaker, you know, don't limit it, uh, yourself um, on uh, on on your treatment or what you have previously. But be open, stay open, and take uh, anything that come uh, open up to to you. So that's what I did in 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 this film. So how uh, 
you know, I met these young Africans, uh, desperate and uh, you know, trying to reach Europe. And uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, you know, I know because I took this way too, that uh, uh, this trip, it, it doesn't guarantee anything for them, right? but you cannot tell them. You, you have no other solution. You cannot say, go home, go home for where, to do what, right? So that was really my, you know, my, 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 uh, my feeling. So um, today, you still observe the same situation in, 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 you know, in the Sahara. You know, the only thing that's changed, you have way more people dying, you know, dying because of the policy in Europe, you know, in, in you know, European policy in the North Africa, you know, that spend them, that pay them to send back Africans, young Africans, to where we do, to the, to the, to the, to the, and to most of them uh, die there, right? It is way back home, it's, uh, it's a dangerous trip, right? So that has to change. That wasn't, the, you know, uh, the case when, when I was I, I was filming there. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I wanna, before I ask you the next question to just underscore about something you said um, at the beginning yeah. of your comments is that, the, you know, the thing about, uranium is not that it's not being mined anymore there, right? It continues to be mined, but because it no longer fetches the prices that it used to, it doesn't have the kind of economic benefit to our elite itself, right? It, it doesn't mean that it doesn't sort of benefit um, France and, you know, its its dependence on, um, on nuclear energy, right? And so there's that that, that tension there, which I think also helps to explain um, the kind of one of the roots of the anti-colonial sentiment that we see being articulated so clearly um, in, for instance, the 2023 coup and the public support for it, right? This, this kind of sense that, that Bazoum and his regime were um, kind of, you know, in, really in bed with, with France and with, you know, with French interest, um, both as it relates to sort of, uh, not just France, but, you know, sort of like Western interest in, um, you know, in all of uh, um, this kind of, quote unquote, counterterrorism work that they're doing um, in the Sahel and, and as Mali and as um, Burkina Faso sort of broke away from that, you know, there was this renewed importance placed on, on, on Niger. And sort of the the coup and its refusal of those kinds of um, relationships was really, um, I think, advancing this critique of of neo colonial relations. Um, and again, it's sort of you know you one begins to look at the much longer history of of that sentiment in your film, right? Because that's what people who are, are articulating um, when they look at what what have been the repercussions of this. Um, dependence on uranium for them, right? It's 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 no longer enriching them. It no longer has any positive net benefits. It's a, only accrues sort of outside. And so I think that that's something that's really important to um, to just articulate. The question that I just you know before I throw it open to everybody else, um, that like I think part of one of the parts of the films that was. Um, emotionally kind of really moving for me um, is the two sequences um, of interviews that you have with the two Togolese women in the bar. And there's so much going on, you know, this, like they're, they're there, they're working, there are no drinks to be served. Literally the only other person besides the two women and you, or the only other living thing in the bar is this bird, you know, that we see flying around, landing on the fan that doesn't work. Um, and there's, so it's it's interesting for me because apart from those two women and um, and uh, another uh, woman that you see in an earlier sequence in an alleyway, um, she doesn't speak, but she's with a group of men who are who are migrants, right? Um, so we see her. So those are the only other mig. Those three are the like migrant women who surface in the, in the film. 
And at one point, the um, you know, the one of the women in the bar who's sitting there and she's just, you know, she doesn't like move at all. Like she's got her face perched up on the bar and she's so still in her body. Um, you know, and it's obvious that she's not going to be making, she can't survive off of the work she's doing no. there. She hasn't yeah. been able, there's no drinks to sell. And she, she, you know, she says, well, you know, you ask her, well, how do you survive? And she said, well, you know, I have, I have my means of survival, survival. So the subtext there is, is this question of prostitution, right? Um, and, you know, for her own reasons of, of, of just dignity and pride, she's not going to articulate that directly, but she's saying it in not so many words. Yeah. And so, so that's there in the film as a kind of quiet but very powerful presence that you can't escape and I just wanted to just maybe hear a little bit about what that those conversations in that bar were like for for you um and the series of questions that you that you asked the two women and especially thinking about sort of like your larger body of of film work um so you get a key um in Doshin Traces of a Mother which have really been you know, centrally concerned with women. Um, I wonder, like, you know, obviously you made a, um, an intentional choice to bring these women into the film, but they don't have the kind of prominence that women have in in, uh, in your other films. So just to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, that's the interesting question. I've been um, uh, reproached, uh, for my question to, to these women, <laughs> uh, I wasn't aware at all that my question will appear in this way. That uh, I did, I I did not understand that my question to all her, her reply, her response to my question, uh, you know, reveals anything like a, you know, like a prostitution. I did not imagine this way at all. <laughs> when when I shoot it, I and that came. I mean, to me, it came. I first became aware of that after the screening of the film. When uh, somebody you know, in the audience asked me, "Say, what do you hope? What do you expect?" You know, for her to reply, I say, "I want to know." I was curious. I want to know how. I say, "Yeah, that's evident." I say, "What is evident?" <laughs> it's enough. Yeah, it's evident. She's doing something. I say, "What?" So I did not understand at all. It's an aspect of her life I did not imagine at all. So um, how do I met? Um, actually, I mean, uh, what you said is, is true, that I wanted to have also some women in, as characters in the film. You know, but in a place like Arlit, it wasn't easy to find women, women's perspective. Um, women, a, are all at home. You don't meet them. You don't see them, right? Uh, it's also the culture. I you know this. The culture, it's like a culture. It's a culture in the, in the place. I have to respect it. I cannot go enter into the family house and and, and meet with women. So I accidentally met these women uh, because the place I met them is the place where we when we take our break. Uh, I like to say it's very hot when it was shooting. It was. 52 degree. So our uh, Celsius, <laughs> 52. That means after 12, you cannot go out. Uh, so we we were looking for a place to, to, to rest. And then we've been shown this place and we didn't know what was the place. And then the first day we've been there, nothing happened. Uh, there was nobody there. It was open. And the second day, these two women were sitting there. So we were trying to buy some drinks and there were no drinks. To eat anything is not. And uh, I, I called one, one, of, one of these women and say, where are you from? I mean, I asked them where they were coming from. We are, actually, I mean, they were from Togo, I'm from Benin. So we are kind of uh, cultural, <laughs> things that that actually found us uh, you know we started talking about oh where we come from the culture i mean it's, it's very close benin and togo there's no difference 
Uh, that's how the conversation actually started, right? And then when we started, I called my camera and I said, that's interesting. You know, that could be the character I'm looking for. That could be, you know, this, you know, uh, female, female characters I'm looking for. And uh, we started shooting uh, the conversation, but the problem was uh, that uh, they just reply with one sentence. You know, when you ask the question, they don't talk too much, just one sentence. So for a filmmaker, it's very difficult when you have characters, you have, uh, uh, that doesn't talk. It's just, pump, you know, go, just one, one sentence, boom, and then wait and see. So that's, it was difficult because I film a lot. I film them a lot, but you cannot do a lot with, with the material, you know, because if, uh, you ask a question as a filmmaker and uh, the person say, yeah. So you cannot do nothing with yeah or no, <laughs> right? So, so many of the, what they said was like that. So that makes that 90% uh, of what I did, what I recorded, I recorded actually many days, I couldn't do anything with that. So the few I could catch where I imagine I, that can be part of the film is what you have seen in, in, in the film, right? So um, that's uh, uh, it's, it's really a, a difficult part of of of, of our lead, uh, you know, because I'm I was very uh, especially after the screening after the you know on I mean show my audience show this aspect of, of, of what I was trying, I mean, what the imagine I was trying to, to show to my audience, which wasn't my intention at all, right, to show them a prostitute, uh, uh, you know, they are respectable, you know, women, you know, with family at home, they left the families at home. The only thing they did is that, you know, they came late, you know, they is, came 20 years late <laughs> to early to the place, and they were stuck there, and they didn't know how to go. You know, so and I even helped them, you know, at the end, that wasn't part of the film, you know, than giving, giving them money to, to say, you know, if you want to go home, take them some money. I know they didn't want to go home, that, you know, they, they, they would keep the money, right? So that's uh, actually the story <laughs> behind uh, this way. Then. I mean, the you know, what you captured, I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of footage and you only used just a teeny amount, but the, the amount yeah. that you did cap, you know use was really in incredibly powerful and just to say you know i don't i don't think that you rendered them in any way shape or form as prostitutes not at all that wasn't what i meant to suggest i mean you 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 they are dignified right i mean they're in 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 their comportment their dress the way that they speak everything it's just that one you know that one small line that clues you into the real deep complexity of 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 her existence right and and yeah. which we know now because again there's so much work that's been done over the last you know 10 15 years about sort of the gendered experience of migration for men and for women and how this question of 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 sex sexual exploitation um sexual abuse and and prostitution um, are are sort of much more kind of I think well known, better understood aspects of of this phenomena of of migration, and of course it's it, it you know the the truth of course is that it is simply not unique to um, to a place like Arlit. I mean, in in fact, when when we think about the way that women get caught up in these migratory routes, in fact, you know, a large percentage of of women who actually make it to you know places like Italy and Spain will end up getting funneled into um, sex work. And so that this is, I mean, I think it's actually a very important part of the film, even if, if actually unintentional at the moment that she makes that revelation about herself. So um, I think at this point, I, um, I wanna just open it up to the audience for, um, for questions. And you can, um, you could, if you preferred, you could certainly type in a question into the chat, but um, also just raise your hand or unmute yourself um, and uh, and ask a question.
uh, I think that's uh, maybe Jesse Shipley. Hi, Karina. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi, all. Thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, I had a sort of follow up question um, based on what you're saying, Karina, and um, the question about visual language um, that sort of as a, I was, you know, in watching the film, I think that sort of visual language is really complicated and interesting. Um, and I'm just curious as a filmmaker, how your visual language, how you thought through that based on your sort of answer to what Karina's talking about around the sort of subtle subtext that sometimes come out in the making of and then in the editing. I'm just wondering, uh, you started out by talking about a little bit about trying to come up with a visual language as a filmmaker. Um, and as someone who's also, I'm a filmmaker and, an, and a scholar, I struggle with trying to get across complicated ideas sometimes in the language of sort of visual representation. I'm just wondering how you how you watch this film now yourself and how your language might have evolved or changed or not over time um, based on the political moment, the sort of visual moment and things like that, if that makes sense. Yes, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think so something that I kept doing is, is that uh, uh, when you come to a location, it's a very important to know, to get to know the rhythm in, in, in the location, the rhythm of life, right? So, and uh, in, in Arlit, Arlit is, uh, it, itself is a, is a slow, it's a slow city, you know. You cannot make a film uh, that's uh, so, you know, so quick like uh, people would do it uh, in uh, in another place of the world, right? So it's it's important for me when I first came in this location. It's uh, how, you know, what read I can adopt, you know, that work with uh, with uh, with a place, right? And uh, in a place where nothing happens. There's nothing happen. There's no movement. You know, people are waiting. You know, they 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 expensively just waiting. So how do you show <laughs> waiting, right? So uh, that's uh, we that's uh, was my you know the first thing I have to decide. It is it, is that, that, that so, you know how the camera position and uh, also doing the editing. It's uh, I, let me tell you the story when I first. Um, came back with my material. Um, I hired an a editor. The editor did not understand, you know, who never been in a place like <laughs> like our lead, uh, don't know Africa, and it was used to edit these quick film interviews and then quick and then did this first editing. I said, no, that's not my film. <laughs> that's not the film. So, and then we try, I say, you know, at some point I say, uh, we have to stop here. Uh, I don't think we, we, we are on the same level of understanding. You know, I, I don't think we can work together because that's not the kind of film I would like to do. So I had to change the editor, uh, right? Who understand uh, what I was trying to tell a story. You know, that's uh, this place, you know, to have this, uh, uh, you can call it a slow editing, <laughs> if, if you want, but slow editing you can do, you can do it when, if you have a material that allows allowed you to do the slow editing, I have this kind of uh, material, I have a long, long take, a long take, for, for instance, right, and uh, 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 all, all, I mean, all the picture you have seen, you know, uh, this, um, you know, lens in a landscape like a, uh, for instance, I have a, I have a, a very long shot, which also with my second editor has been a discussion, a discussion because it was, um, there's nothing happened, and then uh, I, I. I shot it like a 380 degree <laughs> span <laughs> where nothing had happened. Where the editor say, you cannot edit this. I say, yeah, that's the most important part of my film. We have to <laughs> edit it. And it, it took us two, two days of discussion, 
you know, every day you say, are you sure you want to use it? I say, yeah, I'm very sure I want, <laughs> I want to use this. <laughs> and uh, it, then we end up uh, making, I mean, most of the people who have, uh, not only those, those professional, but uh, uh, to get the sense of the place we've been, this void, uh, it's important to have this kind of, of, of shot, for instance, that tells story. That's the, for instance, one example of what you can say is the visual story, the storytelling, you know, to tell, to, to situate uh, uh, your audience, you know, where we are. I just want I just wanted to say quickly that that like the yeah. the opening the opening scene is so amazing because actually when you start the film yeah. um you you actually you wonder whether you actually started the film because the bus that's coming towards the sign that welcomes people to our league doesn't appear to be moving and so you sort of go back and you're like wait is this thing playing and you realize it actually is, but it's there's no there's just no movement until there is movement, but you can't it doesn't actually register on the screen. It's not until you sit there and you're like, what's going on? Is this film not started yet? That you realize, no, indeed, the film has started, but it's just taking a really long time for this bus to be to visually uh, have it resonate that it is actually moving. You know, mm -hmm. and it's it's a brilliant way of encapsulating what you just what you just said right from the very beginning of the film. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, Chiamo? Let's see, can, um, can I, let me see if I can, um, I can unmute you. Or, yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, Thanks for everything so far. It's been really great. Um, I learned a little bit about Agadez and I was wondering why you chose Ali as opposed to Agadez. And I, you mentioned that the uranium project is less um, financially successful than it used to be. And could you explain why? Okay, thank you. So, um, I mean, at the time we were shooting, uh, there was a, a crisis. Uh, international crisis of uranium, you know, in the market, the global market, uh, which is not the case today. <laughs> uranium, so, you know, the price <laughs> went so up today. Uh, uh, and uh, even though there's no change regarding the number of people working in the mine, but, uh, you know, the price of the kilo of uranium in the international market is so high today, you know. Uh, so all this uh, is dependent to to the global discuss, I mean, uh, conversation, you know, let's say uh, global market, right? There was a time where people, uh, the activists, and entire uh, nuclear, <laughs> nuclear, for instance, were saying that uh, uh, uranium, you know, at atom plant or nuclear plants are not no longer. Uh, welcome to the world, right? So that was so in the years 2000. So that was the time where really activists were very uh, active against against nuclear plants in the world, right? So um, which has changed drastically changed today. You know, we now we're coming back, <laughs> coming back where people say even now, you know, in Dubai here, yeah, Dubai there was uh, this gathering where people now are selling uh, nuclear plant as the solution of uh, this global warming, right? So that has changed everything. It's changing everything now. Even the narrative in France that today, you know, for us that uh, you know from the narrative in the in 20 years ago when they say we 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 make no profit in Nigeria now they become even with uh, uh, all of the government in Nigeria is trying now to <laughs> to say or you know uh, uh, Francis still want to stay they don't want to stay there right so uh, you can imagine uh, 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 so there, there's a there's a big 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 change back then in 20 years ago uh, there was a big problem so uh, there were only at when we were there there were only thousand five hundred workers you know from five or ten thousand you know in the in the eighties you can imagine you know how. Uh, 
So regarding your question, Agade is, uh, Agade is a different place. There's no uranium mine. There's <laughs> mines in, in Agade. If we are in the same area, actually, you know, Agade is, is, uh, is part of Alit, even though the two cities are 200 kilometers uh, apart, uh, but it's the same culture, right? Culture area. That was my, my, my setting. Uh, it was my setting because of these mines and because of uh, you know of uh, uh, of the history of Arlit, you know a city that's uh, been created from zero, you know uh, just uh, in the sixty end of the sixties. You know, Agadir is is a, is an old city. It's a very historically very important city, uh, and uh, interesting city too, but for other completely different stories. Yeah. You know. Yeah, just to build quickly on what, what uh, Idrisu is saying. So, you know, one of the interesting things now is that like um, right after the the coup um, in, in Niger, just, you know, in early in 2023, um, France was very quick to sort of say, you know, we're still committed to, um, you know, to the uranium, to, to uranium production there. Um, and in fact, uh, they um, effectively have agreed to, um, this is Oran, this company, right? That is the oh, I know, yes. based in France, um, to uh, extending the life of the only sort of major mine that is still producing um, uh, uranium in Niger by another 40 years. Um, and as Idrisu said earlier, this kind of, has been recast as kind of doing uh, Niger a favor, right? Like if we don't do this without this, you just, you don't have a major driver of your economy. But of course, behind that is something that I tried to allude to earlier in my opening remarks, which is that um, as the, the Ukrainian Russian war has, um, you know, elevated the importance of sanction regimes um, and as Russia is also a, a large producer of uranium, um, France has been put into a situation where they have to actively begin to diversify the places from which they can get uranium. And so again, there's this like return to Niger um, as, as a source. And it just shows you how alive those kind of neo-colonial um, relations uh, remain today. And again, that infuses people's kind of the anti-colonial sentiment that comes through in a popular support for the, the coup that just took place. So thank you for that question. Others? Tabitha. Thank you um, so much for this. And I'm, I'm sorry to take advantage and, and leap in in case anybody else wants to just raise your hand and I'll shut up. Um, but I had this I guess as um, as you were speaking, Idrisu, I was really interested in to what extent, and I don't know if this is an answerable question. Um, let me pull back a little bit. I, I read some of Gabriella Hecht's book on this subject of France's relationship to nuclear power. One of the key kind of arguments in that work is that um, it is about the nuclear exception, right? The idea that, um, you know, uh, unlike other forms of energy, people are sufficiently afraid of the possibility of nuclear crisis that, um, that you get the, a kind of resistance that you don't see for other forms of, or you hadn't seen for other forms of, um, of interaction. And, um, Part of her argument, though, is that the exception to the exception is mining. So while lots of fear of nuclear reactors and what might happen and protests against that by large publics, um, very little, in fact, um, and a, a resistance on the part of the dangers, especially the health dangers of mining. So I wondered if the young men who were coming through um, Arlet now um, are increasingly aware of those dangers and how that has an impact on um, on on our, our lit itself, but also on this migratory pattern that you've pointed out um, so yeah. so thoroughly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, 
I mean, for those who are just in transit, there's no, you know, uh, there's no danger, right? Uh, or very few, you know. Most importantly, those who are in danger, those who live there, you know, uh, there are many generations now, four, around four generations of people living there, living in Arlut. And those people at some point will develop, you know, kind, kind of sickness. You can imagine, it's not just of those with walkers, it's of a mind around the city. And we are in the middle of this, of this right? And uh, there are a lot of wind. And this wind, I, I can tell you, I, I, you can make 10 films on the on the beach alone on, on, on the on this city. You know, I I recorded uh garden, you know, people who produce tomatoes, salad next to, to the mines. You can imagine those people, you know, in within 10, 15, or 20 years, they will develop a kind of cancer. Those who eat these tomatoes, salad, and so on. You know, that's a kind of aspect, uh, you know, I didn't want to, you know, it's, it's uh, when I say it's, it's not an investigation, how, who is responsible for that. Uh, uh, I decided not to go in this direction, even though I recorded that this aspect of, of, of uh, contamination. Otherwise, the film would have been a film around contamination, which I, which wasn't my <laughs> my intention. You know, I want to make a film show a situation uh, that is uh, that I mean uh, more you know, about this relation <laughs> relationship, France France Niger relation relation. So this is uh, uh, and 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 another aspect of for uh, and so don't. Very young people are um, um, uh, enrolled in the mines. Very young, you know. I film a lot of uh, saying, you know, with young people walking, touching, even you are not, you are not with it, rather, rather active, you know, without any protection. I film them. So why are they taking these young people? Because they know. Uh, these people can, you know, they will be happy until their fifties, and then <laughs> sickness will stop, you know, after the fifties, and they will go maybe back home, like my characters, and then cancer will now come out and then kill them, right? So most of the people who live in our lit, you know, they will not be older than 60, 65 years old, as we can see. Uh, all the older people in my film, they all pass away. All. The only people you see who are still alive are the young, you know, Amadou and the older young people. The all, all older people all pass away. Just pass away five years, you know, within five years after the shoot. Issa pass away, uh, you know, five years after the shoot. And all the older men you see in the film, within five years, they all die. They pass away. So you can imagine how many people are dying uh, or, or already died in our lives without anybody, you know, talking about it. You know, I, as I said, you know, um, in in France would have been in France had this situation. You know, there will be a lot of revolt that happened also in, in Limousin. People started talking, and they, when I was still living in France in the year two thousand, you know, they were a, a kind of a demonstration. You know, you know, that's I need to come back to show you. It's here. It's about Africans. Mines are Africans. You know, and at at top plants, it's European. So just to show you how different our value, our life value. Are, you know, it's when it comes when contamination concerns Africans, it's not it's not a topic for, for the people of the world. You know, that's why we talk too much about atom plant, how dangerous atom plant is. It's as dangerous as the mind itself. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for that question. And also just in, in for the film and for this conversation with you and Karina, that um, again, opens up the possibility of really thinking about the interrelationship between, um, and in ways that I, you know, I, or and probably many of us, I don't want to assume, um, didn't necessarily um, uh, understand, right? The sort of um, the, the migratory, the migrations, Algeria, um, Benin, 
um, uh, and, and Niger in between uranium nuclear energy, obviously, but what that relationship was and how it was connected um, even briefly to the coup d'etat and possibly even um, giving us space to give some greater consideration to all of the coup d'etat um, that have overtaken um, the continent in the last several months, though uh, technically we are finished at 2 p.m., so we won't have time to explore that any further uh, right now. I do hope that those who are here will uh, continue to reflect on this and also that we at, um, with French Historical Studies and some of our, um, and of course Africa as a country, will be able to come together again to continue these conversations because they're awfully important. And uh, as you point out, most significantly, very few people really know what's happening. Um, and um, and it, it, there's nothing uh, short of hundreds of thousands of lives, if not millions of lives that are at stake. Um, so I hope that we can continue uh, this. Can I um, turn it over to you, Karina, for a last word? And then we um, will, uh, Judy, our, our fearless leader, will um, will end the call. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the just the note that I would want to end on um, is to really think about like, so, you know, our lead, the second Paris, right? And, you know, are we are we uh, at a historical moment in which we're looking at the possibility of our lead as the second, second Paris, right? Like as Idrisu pointed out, you know, the price of uranium has shot back up as it is now sort of being heralded as an answer um, for our clean energy seeking world, right? And what, you know, what does that mean for, for our elite and for, you know, um, you know, we've got this extension now, a 40 year extension um, of on this mine. What, so what actually will happen? And it's interesting to think, is it possible that, you know, as connecting the story of migration, as folks are moving through our elite, that some will begin to stay again and um, mm -hmm. will get drawn back into mining and even if that doesn't happen what you know what's at stake again for um this population as as the the city may be renewed again because of the in increase in price of uranium so it just you know again to to kind of echo something that idrisu said at the very beginning that on the one hand he's glad you know that people are still watching this film but it saddens him that it has just as much relevance today as it did, you know, in 2005. And I think, you know, that's really the, the very much the case here. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Um, I mean, this has just been the most, one of the most interesting Sunday afternoons uh, I've spent in a long time. And it's a very welcome uh, distraction from, to think differently about what's uh, about what's going on in the world. So thank you so much, Karina, and thank you so much, Idrusa, for um, for coming. Thank you, Tabitha, for pulling this together, and thank you, everyone in the audience. I put a note in about our next uh, one of our next uh, sessions, and follow H the H France list is one of the best ways to uh, to get announcements about it. Um, Thank you, everyone. Happy December. Thank you so much. It's really been it's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thank I you. hope you're I hope you're teaching historians in your course, Idrisu. I was going to ask you about whether you know how many history students you had, as well as well as uh, as well as film students. Um, but we are kind of out of time, so maybe I get to ask you that at another on another occasion. <laughs> I understand. Uh, yeah, we hope we'll come back and talk about endosheen. Yeah, yeah, let's do, let's hopefully. try and do Endosheen. Yeah. I think that would be uh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, really. That's uh, that's a very important initiative. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, David, we were honored. Uh, uh, we were Karina, honored. thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank, thank you for, for being here. All right. Yeah. Bye, all. Bye, Thanks. all.